a huge ban on Apple Watches being sold. A massive video game developer hack revealing some very early titles. A big virtual reality shutdown. And a movie making Christmas Day history. This and a whole lot more taking over the headlines of the past seven days. I'm Jason Grewa, and this is The Fresh Wire. Hey everyone, hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to another episode of The Fresh Wire. It is currently, from when I'm recording this, December 27th, 2023 at 12.55am, a very late episode. I'm also going to try to make this a bit shorter than usual. Thank you everyone tuning in. I hope you all had a fantastic holiday season and a Merry Christmas if you celebrate it. Not a whole lot to dive into this past week as it was Christmas holiday, so a lot of big things that would normally happen she didn't but i did want to start off with a pretty big little small little tidbit from the entertainment industry i would like to jump into but the color purple a really recently released uh, film that seems to have been getting some rave reception and uh, critical acclaim has received the largest christmas day opening for a film since 2009 and the second biggest christmas day opening of all time so big congrats to everyone that was involved with the film as it dominates the box office and maybe i plan to watch it in the future it is very well received it had some tough competition with wonka and whatnot but it seems to be making it through and this and the boy and the heron are absolutely films i plan to see whenever i can so big props to all the people that worked on the film and big congrats i'm glad it is successful. From what I've heard, it is a great one. Now, much shorter than usual entertainment industry section. I understand that, but this may be a shorter episode than usual. Just testing out, experimenting a little bit. But let's get into the tech. A little bit of tech here and there before I get into the big one, which was video game related with Insomniac developer. But let's get into some tech. And we're going to start off with an interesting one. So I think every now and then I've talked about some things going on with cars, whether there's some maybe a big recall or a new interface, you know, something techie. Well, this one is techie for the wrong reasons. Uh, General Motors, GM, has stopped selling the Chevrolet Blazer EV to deal with, quote, software quality issues. Now, that is not something you want to have go on with your car because a mechanic, you know, if it's an engine or a motor or a tire or anything, which can also happen with electric cars, you know, motors and whatnot, they can fix it. They can just replace something or work on it physically. But if it's software, well, you're not really going to have software engineers in the same position as mechanics, especially if it's a problem that GM themselves recognized. So they have paused sales of their brand new Chevy Blazer EV. In a statement provided to a um, news site, The Verge, Chevrolet Communications Executive Director Chad Lyons said the following, our, quote, our team is working quickly to roll out a fix and owners will be contacted with further information on how to schedule their update. So f- some specifics that's been going on, Edmunds, which is very well known for reviewing and reporting on a lot of car information, they reported that two months after purchasing a Chevy Blazer EV for its long-term test fleet, the SUV has been at the dealership for two weeks. 23 fault codes on a diagnostic test, and they wrote, quote, What we got back from the dealer was alarming. The single longest list of major faults we at Edmunds have ever seen on a new car. A writer for Inside EV said after a week-long testing ended after 28 hours, the vehicle's infotainment system, which famously, as I said in an earlier episode, does not have a- Apple CarPlay or Android Auto on purpose, well, they said the infotainment system went blank while he was driving and then in an attempt to charge the battery failed, producing a, quote, service vehicle soon, unquote, error message. So this is not a rare problem. Software quality problems have been a big problem and... GM could only say that it is a limited number of vehicles affected. So that's that's just, well, I, I want to say karma, but I obviously wouldn't wish anyone to have their car mess up on the road or anywhere, really. 
Um, hopefully, uh, GM resolves it as soon as possible. It is just absolutely ridiculous, um, especially because these cars are not cheap. They are 30, 40, 50 grand minimum. It's ridiculous. What's also ridiculous is giving up on a dream, a dream of cross-platform messaging that works with all platforms, that works with the most popular platforms. And unfortunately, Beeper is giving up on its dream because Apple says, screw your dream. Beeper, if you haven't heard earlier episodes, has been trying their hardest to make their iMessage app on Android work at all. First, it was all you needed was a phone number. Then it broke. Then you just need an Apple ID. Then that broke. And then now, with the way it's working, is actually beyond ridiculous. Uh, the latest fix seems to be that Beeper wants users to own or rent a jailbroken iPhone along with having a Mac or Linux Linux computer. Uh, users can start using the app once they follow Beeper's steps to receive their iMessage registration code. But once you do that, you will need to have your iPhone plugged into power and connected to Wi-Fi at all times. Beeper suggests renting one. Uh, if you don't own an old iPhone or don't want to purchase one, they suggest renting one for a few dollars per month. I actually have an, uh, an iPod Touch that is the last model they made and is no longer receiving iOS updates. It obviously can connect to iMessage, but not as a phone. But, you know, it, it's probably the same way that you can connect a Mac to iMessage. So if that's needed, that's cool. But I, don't, I also don't have a Linux computer. Obviously, that's easily installable. Uh, I may have an older laptop or computer somewhere that I may just hook up just to try this out. But at this point, I mean, I liked that you were able to connect your phone number to it. And when that went away, my interest almost completely fizzled. But I don't really talk to anyone through iMessage anyway. So this was I was never really in the thing. If I was still in college, this would probably be pretty nice or modern day high school. This would be a pretty nice thing. But obviously, it is nowhere near as capable as it used to be. And Tim Cook's famous response of buy your mom an iPhone just got a lot scummier and a lot more truthful. Totally unrelated, but the team behind Bieber has met with the Justice Department. New York Times wrote an entire article about what's going on with Bieber and how Apple is just openly admitting that they want to restrict access to iMessage to only their devices for the sake of security and to minimize exploits or whatever. And, you know, Beeper just openly putting their open source code out there for iMessage to show we never hit anything. Um, and the Department of Justice has an ongoing antitrust probe into Apple. And this all comes as uh, legislators, both U.S. senators and Congress people, um, are going deep into this, complaining that this is ridiculous. And it is. So, yeah, there was a meeting with the department's antitrust lawyers on December 12th, a few days after Apple first blocked the app's iMessage for Android solution. As Apple continued to try to block it, yeah, I mean, they've got a whole lot on their hands, especially after what happened here, as Apple has now had to file an appeal to a decision made by the International Trade Commission to ban U.S. sales of the Apple Watch Series 9 and Watch Ultra 2 models. So this is a big deal. Um, Apple with their latest Apple Watches that they released earlier this year, the Series 9 and the Ultra 2, were banned after the International Trade Commission, or ITC, found that Apple infringed on blood oxygen saturation technology patented by health tech firm Massimo. So that's pretty huge. I don't know what's going to happen there. They decided to appeal it the same day that it, uh, the decision was enforced and Apple is no longer able to sell their own Apple Watches, at least their newest ones. It's likely, I think they're still able to sell their older ones, but specifically their newest ones are allegedly used um, tech that is patented. Pretty crazy deal. I'm pretty surprised that that is, you know, someone like Apple should immediately um, have noticed this. The company requesting an emergency stay on the band for at least two weeks as until a decision is made on redesigned versions of the band models. So it's looking like they're going to appeal just so they can maybe sell through the stock they have now and seem to be seem to have maybe accepted the fact that, yeah, they did this. Um, but I 
don't know. I mean, they're saying we strongly disagree. This is a quote by an Apple spokesperson. We strongly disagree with the U.S. ITC decision and resulting exclusion order, and we are taking all measures all measures to return Apple Watch Series 9 and Apple Watch Ultra 2 to customers in the U.S. as soon as possible. So, yeah, the pretty, pretty big stuff. Um, I'm wondering how it will come out of that. I mean, I don't own any Apple products except the iPod Touch, of course. My smartwatch is the Galaxy Watch 6, and it's been treating me well. So I'll stick with that. I'll stick with Android. Thank you very much. What I will not stick with as much starting late next month, Amazon Prime Video. I've talked about this in an earlier episode. They're going to start showing ads sometime in 2024 uh, on certain, on I think all of their content, movies and TV shows on Amazon's streaming service, Amazon Prime Video. Unless you pay an additional two ninety nine a month on top of having Amazon Prime, and they didn't say a date. Now they've confirmed one, January twenty ninth. Knowing them, probably right at midnight. Keeping in mind, Amazon Prime currently costs fourteen ninety nine a month or one hundred thirty nine dollars annually. You can have exclusively Amazon Prime Video for eight ninety nine a month. Although realistically, you, knowing me and my family. We get a lot out of Amazon Prime, so just having Prime Video I don't think would be enough for us. Although $8.99 for all the content they've been having, I don't know. I mean, that doesn't seem that bad. They have a lot of good stuff um, accessible. But, of course, now if you want it to be ad-free, it's going to be $12 or eleven ninety eight, I guess, if it's two ninety nine and eight ninety nine. Um, the new charge for ad-free streaming would bring Prime to just under $18 if you have the normal version. Um, and keeping in mind, Amazon still has their free ad sponsor streaming service, Freevee, which in an email, the company notes that live event content such as sports and content offered through Amazon Freevee will continue to include advertising. I guess they made live event content such as sports like the Thursday night football games that have been on Amazon Prime Video. Yes, those have included ads, and those are, of course, okay because it's football. There's going to be timeouts, and pauses that just going to fill dead air, like Peacock did recently uh, this past weekend when the Buffalo Bills played the Los Angeles Chargers. Fourth quarter was completely commercial-free, which was pretty impressive. I watched it as it unfolded, and it admittedly got a little bit awkward. I can imagine the fact that it was so close to Christmas, they were able to fill a little ha-ha, hee-hee here and there, but a little awkward overall, and, well... Do I want them to do it again? I mean, I don't like ads in general, so sure. But I don't know. I mean, fill it with things that are relevant, at least. I don't know. I don't handle NFL games, and I don't plan to anytime soon, at least in terms of them in person. Covering them? We'll see. What I don't plan to see, but luckily others may be able to. I covered in an earlier episode, it's a lot of recaps and a lot of updates, it seems, for today's episode but discovery shows were originally going to be removed from people's playstation store libraries even if you paid for them well it's now been confirmed that will not be happening so shows you've bought that were discovery shows will not be taken away from you even after you purchase them they were set to disappear new year's eve so happy new year's you just lost it seemed like several hundred maybe a thousand shows but in a statement they said, thanks to, quote, updated licensing arrangements, that is no, unquote, that is no longer going to happen. Like it said, um, this is actually the official note. I think I received this in email as well, which I don't know if that means I own Discovery Show or not. I wouldn't know. I don't even know how to access them on my PS5, PlayStation 5. Well, the new note says, quote, due to updated licensing arrangements, the Discovery content removal plan for December 31st, 2023 is no longer occurring. We appreciate your ongoing support and feedback. Well, I can imagine the feedback is, why are you doing this? Why are you letting it happen? And the support is, well, I'm not going to support you anywhere near as much if you let this happen because it's going to set a horrific precedent. It already kind of did to show that Sony is willing to go this far. Like, oh, yeah, Discovery? Oh, yeah, Warner Bros. Discovery? You're not going to – you're going to screw us over? Well, we're going to screw over the fans instead. How about that? Well, they're going to blame you, <laughs> Sony. I mean, I'm glad that this was good news for them. But it also, like I said, set a precedent that any digital content you purchase with your own money, not streaming service, but 
paying for a movie digitally or TV show digitally is not like buying a Blu-ray or DVD where you can keep those for as long as you can keep them in good condition or you can rip them. I don't know the legal situation with that, but it's hardware capable. Depending on the hardware you have, you can rip movies and TV shows. But, you know, with these, rather than hoping that your Blu-ray or DVD doesn't rot out or decay, but you rip it beforehand, possibly, this is a long-term rental. Instead, it's just at the mercy of the content library owner, like Sony or Microsoft. Really stupid, but yeah, if you own some classic Mythbusters episodes, you can go right back to it. Now, a little bit of a video game section, but I'm actually, it's just one really big thing, and it is huge, a huge, huge thing that came out. And I'm going to be careful covering it because a lot of personal information was part of this, and I'm not going to go too deep into it. But Insomniac, who, uh, Insomniac Games, which recently released the very well-received Spider-Man 2 video game for the PlayStation 5. I've yet to play it, but I do plan to in the near future. Hopefully a good sale comes around. But it, it seems to be worth 70 bucks. Don't know if I'm ready for that yet, but that's not the topic. In recent days, Insomniac Games had a horrific, a huge, huge data breach that was, I think, over a terabyte in size, which is a lot of... That's That's a lot of storage and it revealed a lot and i mean a lot of things that they plan to do uh, the i don't know how much i want to get into spoilers for what they could do but i'll say a few things it showed uh it had a playable build of wolverine which seems to be one of insomniac games next games next titles it's already been announced but there was an early build for Wolverine and a lot of gameplay and videos on it. It also announced that they're going to eventually do, all this was part of the leak, um, Spider-Man 3, a new Venom game, and an X-Men game. A lot of crazy stuff. Um, if you want to do more research on it, you can. It's been out for uh, several days now, and I don't want to dive into it too much because it's obviously a horrific hack that was absolutely devastating on Insomniac Games, and I hope that they can recover from this fully. They released a statement on it. Part of it reading, we're both saddened and angered about the recent criminal cyber attack on our studio and the emotional toll it's taken on our team. We have focused inwardly for several days to support each other. And, uh, unquote, and they also specified a little bit on Marvel's Wolverine because this is a huge deal. Early gameplay and early build of Wolverine showing off. And I'm already seeing some really weird tweets on x slash twitter.com about some people like, oh, look at this game, and then look at Wolverine. It's like, you're, you're the stupidest gamer around. It's a very early build. Reportedly, I think it's like not even that recent of a build. Um, it's like 2021, I think. It's a very early build. And, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. They gave a little bit of a statement on that. You're following. Quote, Marvel's Wolverine continues as planned. The game is in production and will no doubt evolve throughout development, as do all our plans. We will share official information about Marvel's Wolverine when the time is right. They didn't specify anything else because, of course, why would they? No other game that was leaked as part of this was announced beforehand. They did not announce a Venom game, nor Spider-Man 3, nor X-Men, which they said, I think, is 2031. So that and Spider-Man 3, I'm just saying up front now, don't expect that to be on at least built for PlayStation 5. Maybe Spider-Man 3. X-Men, not in 2031. Um, also, a huge deal that's 2031. X-Men, uh, X-Men AAA game made by the people that made Spider-Man, the Spider-Man, recent Spider-Man titles, so huge deal. And, yeah, I don't know. I mean, pretty crazy situation. Uh, what's also a crazy one that was a bit confusing, but I think I can talk about it. Um, the person that hacked into... Uh, servers that involved Grand Theft Auto 6 and released footage of it. 18-year-old hacker sentenced to life inside a hospital prison, according to a report from the BBC. So, you know, a little bit of context. This person that I won't name, I mean, they're 18 years old, so I'm not going to go into that. This is obviously life-changing for them. 
Uh, they leaked 90 videos of ga- gameplay for Grand Theft Auto 6, which was announced not too long ago, last September while out on bail for hacking NVIDIA and the Brit- and a British telecom provider. <laughs> In terms of the Rockstar Games, this is a crazy part. He stayed at a hotel under police protection during this time. He still managed to carry out an attack on Rockstar Games by using the rooms included an Amazon Fire Stick and a, quote, newly purchased smartphone, keyboard, and mouse, unquote, according to a separate BBC report. So that's pretty crazy. Um, That it all happened through that, through the power of that. (laughs) Hotel Wi-Fi, an Amazon Fire Stick, and a smartphone, keyboard, and mouse. And that's all you needed to hack into <laughs> the servers for Grand Theft Auto 6. Wow. So, wow. Pretty crazy stuff. Um, with that being said, I'm still excited for Grand Theft Auto 6. And I did get to see a little bit of the gameplay, but I can tell it was very early. And I know it's going to look a lot better than what it was. I'm not stupid like some people where. They were looking at the early build for Wolverine and saying, wow, it looks like garbage. And then luckily the tweet that actually gets popular from it is someone saying, are you a A lot of bad words that I can't say here or this podcast will be uh, become explicit. Now a little bit of VR, Uh, some good and some bad. We'll start with the bad. Microsoft, well, this may be bad for some, but probably very little. Microsoft is discontinuing what it's called what it called Windows Mixed Reality, adding it to a list of deprecated Windows features. It was first introduced by Microsoft back in 2017 as part of its bid to compete with virtual reality rivals like HTC and Oculus, which is now owned by Meta, hence the Meta Quest 3. But it used to be the Oculus Quest, Oculus Quest 2. And HTC with their Vive uh, VR headsets more so focused on um, being a computer or PC focused headset whether rather than what meta is doing now with the quest 3 it being standalone but it can also work with computers i own one fantastic stuff but windows mixed reality was kind of like that third option meant to serve as a portal to games apps and other experiences within the vr space it wasn't just microsoft with their hololens but also acer dell lenovo asus hp and samsung all making what they called mixed reality headsets compatible with this platform now, in terms of what's out there already, the HoloLens 2, which is more focused on enterprise use, Microsoft, not too long ago, released a free upgrade for Windows 11. And keep in mind, that headset, as a certain other one that I'll talk about in just a moment, is, was $3,500. So, while we, keep in mind, as I've said, um, you know, VR is still going to be a huge industry, if not already, Recently, Microsoft has started to integrate some well-known Microsoft properties into the MetaQuest headsets, including Microsoft Office, including Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and the Xbox Cloud Gaming platform. So if you have Game Pass Ultimate, you can now play all those games that you could play on your phone now in the comfort of your virtual reality landscape. And of course, the Microsoft Mesh app, which will soon let coworkers meet in a virtual space no headset required so microsoft's not done with vr but it's clear that they are downsizing and not being as ambitious as maybe they were several years ago now they're just like all right well meta won a big chunk of the battle let's just help them out especially because a huge competitor is approaching very quickly um apple uh earlier back in june of this year, 2023, final time I can say that, they announced the Apple Vision Pro, a pretty cool-looking VR headset that they didn't call a VR headset because it's so much more than that, especially with a price of $3,499. Well, they also announced it would be launching early next year, early 2024. And reportedly, that is February. A reporter by Bloomberg said things are lining up for the device to launch by February. He says... Uh, Mark German says we shouldn't expect another launch event, but bringing this to market is a major undertaking that means preparing Apple Store employees to guide new users, adjust fitting, and deal with prescription lens options. Yes, understandable. And yeah, the Vision OS has been in beta. I think it's been able to be tested out a bit by developers, which is why Apple announced this so early with an early 2024 launch. They announced it back in June. So now 
they're you know all good to go and especially with a recent release of iOS 17.2 enabling the iPhone 15 Pro to capture 3D encoded spatial videos in 1080p resolution at 30 frames per second so if you if your phone if your modern 2023 smartphone can only max out on a feature at 1080p 30 frames per second it is an extremely power intense video and 3d encoded spatial video that sounds exactly what i think needs to be 1080p 30 freaking although hopefully with the iphone 15 pro or maybe the next iphone pro model they can do 60 frames per second instead as you're going to be watching this in a virtual reality or mixed reality landscape like apple hopes you do you know, higher frame rate would be better than I think a high resolution. 1080p is all right, but the higher frame rate is going to be much nicer. So pretty excited for it. I'm wondering how it's going to change things with this sort of massively anticipated headset. HoloLens was obviously a thing for a little bit, but this is going to be from Apple. It's going to be meant for someone. Um, I don't know who yet. Some weird audience that will include uh, wealthy YouTubers unless they send them out for free, in which case they will 99% ask for them back. So, I don't know. I'm going to see a lot on it. Uh, I will not buy one. No plan to. Although I can imagine this going to be... Revolu I don't know about revolutionary. With this price, if it was... I think it was, if this was $1,000, I think this would be revolutionary. As from what I'm seeing. But when it launches, I guess we'll know for certain. And it was never going to be a thousand. This is Apple's first attempt at a incredible new industry that's not new at this point, nearly a decade. But I don't know. Wait and see approach, especially if it's thirty five hundred dollars. I'm not going to buy one, but maybe someone will. And that'll be it for most of this. But of course, I want to get a little bit of futurology, and I got to talk about it because this is actually a pretty cool one. Um, it popped up not too long ago for me, and I wanted to cover it. Apparently, according to Eureka Alert, a very interesting news release, a peer-reviewed publication. The title is, Scientists Develop Flying Dragon Robot to Fight Fires from a Distance. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, four meter long, remotely controllable flying firehouse robot engineered to safely and efficiently extinguish fires in buildings by directly approaching the fire sources. This was The statement was said by a joint corresponding author, an author it's also an assistant professor at Osaka University. And, um, yeah, I mean, from the image I'm seeing here, yeah, it's uh, literal, almost exactly what was said. Prototype of a firehouse robot, firehose robot, sorry, uh, with the nozzles spouting water at a rate of 6.6 .6 liters per second, a pressure of up to one megapascal. And there's even a conventional thermal imaging camera attached to it that allows it to help locate where the fire is. Uh, it, huh, I mean, they're saying it's ready to fly in approximately 10 years. Being able to, uh, quote, we estimate that it will take approximately 10 more years to deploy a robot in real-world firefighting scenarios. That is crazy. Uh, unquote, that is crazy. Um, the primary challenge being to extend its reach beyond 10 meters so, will this happen? Well, that's the whole point of futurology, right? You know it, you love it, and you fear for it, you hope for it. Sometimes it just isn't meant to be, and other times you're like, wow, this really is possible that it could be mainstream. Will it? Will it not? No one knows. But I'm glad it's being worked on every now and then. And that'll be it for this shortened episode of The Fresh Wire. Thank you all for tuning in. I wanted to experiment a little bit and focus on a few topics more critically, more deeply, and be a little more personal, loose a little bit. So thank you all for tuning in for today's episode. I apologize for it being a little later than usual, um, the holiday season and whatnot. What can I say? But for 2024, I hope to continue this podcast going forward, maybe it being a little earlier for a release than usual, absolutely compared to this one. But that'll be it for me. Thank you all once more for tuning in. Hope you have a good morning afternoon evening night or day wherever you are however you live i appreciate it from the bottom of my heart one last time so long for me take care of yourselves and have a gosh darn good one see you around peace